We're here in Nova Scotia at the 15th annual Halifax International Security Forum. The forum couldn't be taking place at a more critical time. From tensions with China to concerns about Iranian interference, the conflict in the Middle East and Russia's war in Ukraine, everyone is here from decision makers to dissidents to generals, trying to find a way forward in our world that sometimes feels like it's exploding. I'm Mercedes Stevenson. The West Block begins now. The October 7th attack by Hamas in Israel has put the role of Iran in supporting Hamas and Hezbollah under increasing scrutiny. But critics of the regime say countries like Canada are also at risk. I sit down with prominent Iranian activist Masi Alinejad, who says Prime Minister Justin Trudeau needs to take action now. And what will the new tone between Washington and Beijing mean for Taiwan? As the country prepares for presidential elections in January, I speak to Taiwan's Deputy Foreign Minister about the constant threat of Chinese military action. The Iranian regime casts a long shadow around the world, one that has become even more obvious since Hamas attacked Israel on October 7th. Tehran uses proxy terrorist groups like Hamas and Hezbollah across the Middle East. But a global news investigation found the regime's tentacles extend to right here in Canada. Our Negar Mostahedi uncovered evidence of more than 700 regime operatives here on Canadian soil. From money laundering to threats to murder plots, the impunity with which the regime appears to be operating in Canada is shocking. Renowned Iranian human rights activist Masi Alinejad sat down with me to share a fresh warning and a bone-chilling message for Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Masi, thank you so much for joining us today. I, I know that it was actually a, a dangerous thing, potentially, for you to come to Canada. Uh, even saying this, it's like, it's so weird. Like, just dangerous to be in Canada? Oh, I love Canada. Thank you so much for having me. But yes, it was. Because of my situation being critical of the Islamic Republic, uh, there is still a threat, not only against me, against everyone who criticized the Islamic Republic in Canada. You normally are in Brooklyn, and you spoke with 60 Minutes and told the story about how the Iranian regime not only wants you kidnapped, they want you dead. They tried to have you killed. What happened? Ooh, yeah, they want me dead. Um, first of all, they hate women like me, like you. I mean, we have beautiful hair, so that even makes them more hate you because they don't want you to show your hair. But uh, me, because of actually campaigning against compulsory veiling, campaigning against the Islamic Republic, um, they hate me. A lot so that's why first they went after women who were sending videos to me like you know simply walking unveiled and making video and saying hi Massey we enjoy the winner her we want to be free this is my you know practice of civil disobedience they brought those women on TV to denounce me publicly made them to do false confessions that didn't work because other women joined. And then they went after my family members. They like, you know, I put my brother in prison for two years to keep me silent. Didn't work. Then different tactics, sending killers to New York. A man with loaded gun with AK-47 got arrested in front of my house. Yes, in Brooklyn. You see these stories, you hear them and they sound like something out of a mystery novel or, or a bad movie, but it's it's happening here, it's happening in New York, but also in Canada. We recently did a documentary, we found that at least 700 regime affiliates are here in Canada, and the Iranian diaspora population says they're being intimidated by them. But you know what makes me angry the most? It's like the family members of one of the well-known uh, victims of the Islamic Republic, Neda Agha Sultan. You have to see the video of her getting killed by Revolutionary Guards in the street, which went viral. So her family members were denied visa by Canadian government. But at the same time, you see that the member of Revolutionary Guards themselves, who's shooting people in the chest hard, receiving 
visa and being welcomed in Canada. That makes me angry. So why do you think the Canadian government is not doing more to stop these people from coming to Canada? You know, this question should be asked um, in front of Prime Minister Trudeau. I want you to sit down and, and, and ask I, this question. I'd actually love to give you his response because we, we did ask him you that. You did. And what his response was is that the government will continue to do everything <sighs> necessary to cliche. hold the regime accountable. They say they've criminalized them so they are not allowed to enter Canada, but they have not designated the IRGC as a, as a terror entity, which some activists here say is necessary. You know, th these are cliche and an empty word. And Prime Minister Trudeau, I want to use this camera and talk to you directly. Don't be scared of me and women like, you know, you and critical journalists and Iranian Canadians in Canada. We love Canada. We love peace and security and democracy. We love Canada to be a shelter for, you know, decent people. And you're putting the lives of Canadians in danger. So I want to meet you. That's all I can say, because otherwise he's going to come up with a lot of empty words saying that we stand with the people of Iran. No, please sit down and make decisions how to protect uh, human rights, how to protect democracy in Canada. That's very important. I was the one four years ago in Canadian Parliament. I warned Prime Minister Trudeau's government that put the Revolutionary Guards on the terrorist list. They didn't. What happened? The same Revolutionary Guards killed Iranian Canadians by shooting down the Ukrainian airplane. So that's why when we warn Prime Minister Trudeau, it means that we know the danger is coming. Now Revolutionary Guards are everywhere, everywhere, sponsoring Hamas to kill um, civilians in Israel. And that's one of the questions I wanted to ask you. What, what would these members of the Iranian regime be doing in Canada? Spying, money laundering, everything. Spreading the ideology of the Islamic Republic. Wow, they can do a lot. That's the goal of Islamic revolution since when they took over Iran 40 years ago. Uh, Khomeini was saying that we have to export our revolution, our values. Child marriage, you know, this is one of the values of uh, Islamic revolution. Compulsory veiling, you know, and spreading terrorist ideology, saying that if anyone do not follow our values and ideology, they can be eliminated. You were warned by the FBI that Canada might be particularly dangerous for you. I think a lot of Canadians would be shocked and horrified by that. I don't want Canadian people get uh, angry with me because of my situation now, you hear that a lot on media that Canada is not safe, Canada is not safe, don't go there. But honestly, this is actually, um, to me, it's a warning. Uh, and, and all Canadians should actually put pressure on the government in Canada because it's not good to hear actually that as, as Canadian citizens hear that most of the time that Canada is not safe. Canada became a haven for Islamic Republic agents. Canada is a country that a lot of people have respect for it. In, in my country, a lot of people want to come to Canada and enjoy freedom. But now they say that, oh no, let's not go to Canada because it's not safe. Can you believe that? Or people here, like Iranians saying that, we see a lot of, uh, not only the agents of the Islamic Republic, those who integrated us around us. So it's, it's beyond sad. It's beyond sad. I think we have to renew democracy. We have to be uh, vigilant and think about it again, that what are we going to do with our country? America the same. I see a lot of, you know, uh, relative of the Ayatollahs, those who say death to America, they are enjoying their luxury lives in America as well. And that's sad. What did the FBI tell you about the RCMP's ability to protect you in Canada? I mean, I have to thank uh, the FBI always actually, you know, letting the, uh, the police in Canada know and they are always there to protect me. But that's, I don't want anything for myself. 
I want them to protect Canada. I want them to protect uh, people who live here. Yeah, I'm only one person. I'm not scared of getting killed. I'm not honestly scared for myself. But this is a scary that in front of the eyes of free world, we see that the Islamic Republic threatening national security of Canada and national security of America. Yes, I was told by the FBI that the same people who plotted to kidnap me, they were the same group trying to kidnap two uh, Canadian citizens on Canadian soil. Yes, that was like public. You can read the indictment by, you know, Department of Justice in America. When they published that, I was like, wow, then I'm not alone. The same member of Revolutionary Guards who were trying to kidnap me, they were after two Canadians and two uh, UK citizens. That's why I say that. Where are you, the democratic countries? What has happened to you in terms of threats or activity since you Nothing. spoke I'm to Global I'm getting louder news. and louder. <laughs> <laughs> As you see me, I'm full of life, you know. I want to enjoy my life. I don't want to live in fear. I remember the day when, uh, yeah, when the FBI showed me, like, the text message between the killers, one in New York, the one in Iranian intelligence service saying that as soon as she came out, the show is over. That was a text message between them. And the guy in Iran was saying that that's going to be a birthday gift for me. I just turned back to my husband. I said that they talk about my dead body as a gift. So it's disgusting, no? Absolutely. But I said to myself, wow, so I'm only 45 kilos. I'm not carrying weapon, nothing. But they are scared of me. So that gives me hope. So it's like, you know, Iranian women, teenagers. They're scaring the whole regime with guns and bullets, power, money, everything. But they're scared of Iranian women's hair. Like teenagers walking in the streets, they put a lot of morality police everywhere to arrest them, to kill them. That shows we are powerful and they're scared of us, you know. Masi, thank you so much. Of course, thank you so much for having me. Great. Up next, U.S. President Joe Biden says he made important progress in his meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping. Will that protect Taiwan from Chinese military aggression? A historic meeting between U.S. President Joe Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping may have dialed down the threat of war with China. As you know, I just concluded several hours the meetings with President Xi, and I believe they're some of the most constructive and productive discussions we've had. There is, however, a sticking point, the relationship with Taiwan. Will the new tone between Biden and Xi help to protect Taiwan from the possibility of a Chinese invasion? I spoke to Taiwan's Deputy Foreign Minister of Affairs, Roy Chun Li. There's a lot of fear that there could be an accidental third world war, essentially. As you sit there and watch this uh, from the Taiwanese perspective, what does this meeting mean for Taiwan's security? Has it helped or do you think that there's still a high potential for China to invade? Well, first of all, this summit between uh, President Xi and President Biden definitely helps to uh, provide some level of certainty in relation to the tension that has been unfolding and developing over the last 24 months. Um, we were joking that uh, there were more naval and war plans and naval vessels sailing through Taiwan Straits than commercial ships and, and airplanes nowadays uh, because it becomes a kind of hot spot for all the superpowers, not only superpowers, but countries like Canada or Japan or even South Korea and Germany. German uh, warships are now uh, trying to uh, maintain the, the peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait by crossing uh, through, sailing through the uh, Taiwan Strait uh, to ensure that there is a freedom of navigation. And China, on the other hand, is trying to create a military new normal by um, intimidating all the uh, war plans or naval ships that are sailing through Taiwan Strait. Uh, one of the objectives we suspect 
is that China is trying to convert the Taiwan Strait into a domestic water. So it is no mm. longer, it, it will be an internal water of China. It's, it's, uh, you require Chinese permission to sail through the cross. They are not there yet, but they are trying to create a new normal so that if you don't push back against that, it will become a, a normal. Now, so that signifies the importance of this uh, summit between Xi Jinping and, and President Biden because they, uh, President Biden has been relatively straightforward to uh, express our concerns and, and reservations and oppositions to China's actions, especially in, 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 in that part of the world. And, and, and well, Xi Jinping, of course, re, uh, react to those, to those uh, remarks or demands by uh, sh sharing virtually with us that they have no, no plan to have war with anyone and they are happy to resume military uh, talks at all levels. So that creates some um, safeguards or, or guardrails, not necessarily removing all the threats and dangers, but at least some uh, guardrails. China has clearly been escalating in, towards, in terms of its, its menacing posture towards Taiwan. Tell us what those threats have looked like for you. What does it involve? Because we just see when they intercept a Canadian or American ship or a Canadian plane, it makes our news. But for Canadians out there, what have the Taiwanese people been living with? If you are living in Taiwan, the reality is that every day you wake up, you turn on, you, you're logging into the internet, and you can check on the numbers of uh, Chinese war plans that have approached Taiwan overnight in the last 24 hours. Sometimes the number is five, sometimes the number is 90. Every day? Every day. Uh, wow. Every day. So it becomes part of the daily uh, uh, threat. So the threat is not only on the paper, it's actually in the sky, in the sea surrounding Taiwan. Constantly there are four to five Chinese naval vessels stationed at the four corners of Taiwan. And they change guards uh, on, on a weekly basis. Of course, they are not into Taiwan's territorial waters, certainly, but they, 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 their posture is such that they can do that over, over the next 10, 10 minutes. So that's how close they are, and that's the, how frequently they are uh, intimidating Taiwan on, on those military fronts. But I, I need to add another element, that is intimidation and corrosion in the digital world. On a daily basis, we receive thousands of cyber attacks. Last year, Taiwan's private, uh, public sector received over 30 million cyber attacks every month. That is 1,000 times more than European countries on average. It's extraordinary. So it's not only the war plans, it's not only the naval vessels, but also the cyber attacks and the disinformation. Not to mention the uh, election interference that the uh, Canadian are now so aware, so familiar with. For Taiwan, um, it's, it's also like on a daily basis that we face interference from China. So it's, I, I, we describe this as a hybrid warfare. It's a warfare that is in combination of military threats, intimidation, plus cyber attacks and disinformation. What do you think the chance is of a Chinese military invasion? I think in the foreseeable future it's quite unlikely. Because first of all, China is not ready, militarily and economically. It, looking at uh, Russia's invasion to Ukraine, you, you, you realize that it's not a competition between the hardwares. It's also about financial capacity. It's also about the depth, the, the depth of your manufacturing sector, for example. So in that regard, China is China's readiness is not only reflected on how many vessels they have. It's also about the capacity to sustain uh, a, a military conflict. So for the time being, China is not there yet, but they are working towards that objective. They are, and also uh, China's uh, calculation is based on also the uncertainty and the risks associated with the military attack, on, especially on their political authority in China. So they want to make sure that they, they have to win the war, the Communist Party will stay in power after, with or without a, a, a war, and, and they have to do all these calculations. So 
what we have been doing is to increase the uncertainty, increase the the costs mm. of uh, military uh, 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 non-military uh, deterrence. Exactly, but the key is they continue to exercise this uh, military intimidation for three objectives. First of all, to create fear in Taiwan. So all these uh, military exercises can provide a, 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 a a factor that will divide Taiwan society. Secondly, is the explicit election interference. Because in Taiwan, the, the political debate at this point of time is about whether the election next year, next January, is the decision between war and peace. So China is actually providing man-made evidence to support the argument that it is indeed a choice between war and peace. Well, they are the source of the war, but they are saying that, look, you should choose, get your decision right. Get the party who won't be creating war. Get the party, elect the party who will bring peace. So to, to our uh, perspective, it is uh, explicit, direct interference of election. And lastly, it's providing chilling fact to the international community so that Taiwan will be isolated from other countries top leaders from Canada will feel a little bit concerned to visit Taiwan. Thank you so much for joining us today. I know you've got a lot of work ahead of you on this trip, and uh, we look forward to seeing the future of Taiwan. Yes. Up next, will Canada match its messaging from the Halifax International Security Forum about increased defense spending or continue cuts and be left out in the cold by allies? for one last thing. The discussion here in Halifax has been all about strengthening defense and security as the world becomes more unpredictable and autocratic regimes are emboldened. Canada's Defense Minister Bill Blair delivered a speech here calling for enhanced defense spending, a position at odds with the current reality as Ottawa plans military spending cuts. I asked U.S. Senator Jean Shaheen, a powerful Democrat who sits on the U.S. Senate Committee on Foreign Relations and the Senate Armed Services Committee, what message Canada will be sending if we don't spend more on defense. Well, I think um, the message is one to all of our allies, not just the United States, but to all of NATO. Uh, I was just in the Western Balkans in Europe, in um, North Macedonia, where they're spending over 2% of their GDP on defense. And they, as they said to me, we provided every weapon system we could to Ukraine. Um, all that's left in, in our country now is the band. And I think we're seeing that kind of commitment and sacrifice on the part of some of the smallest allies in NATO. And so it's important for the bigger partners to make sure that we're also putting in our fair share. We'll see if that defense spending comes through. That's our show today from Halifax. We'll see you next week from Ottawa.